Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is part 22 of What If Deku Had a Vampire Quirk. If you guys enjoy this what if, and want to see part 23 of it, comment down below, and let me know. Also check out previous parts of this what if. I have created a playlist for this what if, where you can find all the previous parts, link is in the description. And go ahead, and check out other what ifs in the channel. Before we start please do support for more awesome content. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a like, and also share this video with your friends. So let's start this video. The following week went by as usual for Izuku. The only difference, that this time was the after-school counseling, that the vampire had to take. Hound Dog was in charge of it, using his time with the vampire, to talk about the events, that happened on Hosu. The vampire collaborated with his teacher, answering the man's questions to the best of his abilities. Izuku didn't regret his course of action on the district, and he stated the fact clearly to him teacher, guilt wasn't on his mind, neither was regret. Of course, some melancholy would strike the vampire once in a while, but he toughened his resolve and endured his burden. He had been doing it since young, it wasn't anything new for him. The whispers and rumors about him had increased among the halls and rooms of Yue, the student body still unsure what to make of him. His sensitive ears could easily pick the hushed whispers and under the breath talk of a few second and third years, as they discussed rumors about him. Izuku wasn't one to pay much attention to hearsay, and he did his best to ignore the side glances that happened when he passed by. Hostility was rather rare, but fear of the unknown was a great source of fuel for rumors, especially when inside a high school. Among his classmates, it was clear that a divide had happened. He wouldn't say factions, but his classroom had become divided into a few cliches that had their own ways. There were those that calmly talked with him, and seemed mostly unaffected by the happenstance that was his fight against the hero killer, as well as the Nomu. Todoroki, Yuraka, Tokoyami, Kyoka and Iida. There were those that disliked the vampire, and either wanted nothing to do with him or tolerated him. Bakugo and Yuirozu. And there were the remaining students that either were neutral to him or kept their distance from him. That group was made of the remaining students. To say that there was tension in class would be an understatement, considering the circumstances. Izuku was never one to compare or scale his hardships against those of other people. Life wasn't a competition to see who had suffered the most after all. Yet, he couldn't help but harbor some hostile feelings for a few of his classmates, due to this sort of attitude. He knew it was petty to hold this sort of grudge against those that were, justifiably, scared of him, but in the end he was still a human. Such topic had been the focus of today's session with Hound Dog. His personal feelings on the matter of the attitude of both his classmates and the student body towards him. It was one of the few sessions this week that Izuku had had some trouble expressing himself. Normally the vampire was quite eloquent, if a bit reserved, with his words and feelings. Finding himself relying on his wild side to express what was in his mind, was an unusual feeling, since Izuku was always trying to only use his rational mind. The vampire exited the room he had been talking with Hound Dog, and released a tired sigh. He wondered if Mei was still waiting for him, or if she had already gone home. She had been rather enthusiastic to show him a few pieces of support gear she had developed especially for him, making the Hemomancer curious about the equipment. There was also the matter of the first term exams coming up. Just because Yue was a heroic school did not mean that they had leeway to slack off on their studies. Izuku felt that he needed to head the books for a few subjects, all the recent action leaving little time to academic matters. He could set a study session with the mechanic to see if there was anything she felt unsure and help her out. It was fortunate for him that Mei was such a techno-savvy gal, managing to fix his broken phone in such a short while. He'd have to reward her with something special for her quick work. The vampire sent a text to the pink-haired guy, waiting under a sakura tree for a response. A few minutes ran by as he waited, checking his emails and answering a few messages. One unread message from M. Shield, two unread messages from Yuraka Karyo. Izuku quickly read the contents of the messages, quite happy with their contents. From Karyo's chat the message that the construction of his beachfront house was ahead of schedule, made the vampire grin, his lips splitting with a smile that onlookers would definitively call creepy. The green-haired teen fixed his countenance, managing to return his face to his usual serious self. From the other chat, however, the green teen could not contain his smile. His fangs poked out from his mouth as Izuku stared hard at the contents of the message. A validated ticket for I Island for a three-day stay, food and housing included. Together with those already awesome benefits was also the confirmation that the genius legend of support items would take a look at his quirk file. David Shield himself would study True Ancestor. Izuku couldn't ask for a better chance than this. As the vampire gushed in joy at the emails, another chat window popped up. The message was from Mei, the girl already at his mother's apartment. He texted her that he was on his way, his curiosity at the items that she had finally finished growing by the second. The train ride back home was quiet, Izuku using his head constantly so as to avoid recognition. A fair number of journalists had already tried to approach him, some more insistent than others on their endeavors to try to interview him. 
The vampire thanked the heavens that his mother's address was never made public, else he was sure that his already small sleep schedule would be reduced to nothing. Reaching home, the vampire threw his backpack on the couch, and made his way to the kitchen, wishing to quench his thirst with some blood. Ever since he drained the winged Nomu, Izuku's thirst had been sedated. The feeling of satiation persisted for a while, the vampire himself wondering if it would return with a vengeance, or if it would stay mellow like this. He opened his mini fridge and took two blood bags his usual numbers would be up to five on hard days like this, and sank his fangs into the plastic bags, draining them of the crimson contents. His ears picked on the sounds of me coming closer, the green-haired teen already waiting for the girl to slam into him like a ballistic missile. Contrary to his expectations, Mei calmly walked closer to him, carrying with her a metallic suitcase. Hey, Zuku. The mechanic girl greeted him, coming to nuzzle against his chest, and deliver a small kiss on his lips. Izuku hugged her, wishing to extend the kiss for a while longer. He was almost successful, but the girl was the one, that separated from him. Come, I want to show you the babies I have been working on for you. She grasped his tie and lightly dragged him to the living room. Izuku's curiosity made the vampire agree silently and wait for the revelation. He has seen bits of Mei's blueprints, but nothing that could truly point out what she had been designing. The vampire had his suspicions, but nothing really concrete. Now that Mei had finally completed whatever she had been building, he could hardly wait for the girl to reveal it. Mei placed the case on the coffee table, undoing the latches on the front, and slowly raising the top part of the suitcase, Izuku sitting by her side, shedding his own school coat and loosening his tie, and looking over the items carefully placed on foam. His emerald green eyes widened, Izuku looked at Mei with a worried gaze. He placed his right hand on the girl's left one, some tension on his face. Mei, are these? His questions hang on the air, Izuku's eyes going back to the items inside the open suitcase. It would be impossible for Izuku to not recognize the items, hard to come by as they were. Guns. The vampire wasn't a military nut so the specific models or names were an unknown for him, but he could somewhat identify them. Guns were already rare in Japan, more so now in the age of quirks, but the police still had them and some pro heroes did use firearms. Izuku was no pro hero, hell, he was barely a trainee. Yes. I designed them based on real firearms, and I promised Power Loader Sensei that I registered them properly within the database of the government. He agreed to let me build them under the conditions that I take full responsibility for their use, and tell him why I built them. Mei spoke timidly, and while this usually would be the time when his more sadistic teasing side would flare out, Izuku could only gaze worriedly between Mei and the case containing the weapons. It was completely different, the feeling of owning a blade, and now the possibility of him owning a gun. I noticed something about your powers, Izuku. You don't really have long-range options that don't tap into your blood. All those moves you have written into your notebooks use some of your blood, and eventually you can run out of it or become weakened. It is one of the reasons you are so good at close quarters, and why you develop gap closers so efficient. Mei continued her explanations, her hand firmly holding Izuku's. The girl turned her face to stare at him, her sight-shaped pupils closing in on his face. Every time that a villain had equal or better close quarters prowls to yours, you've been hurt bad. I don't want that. It may look cowardly or not be original, but I made these so that you don't always need to get close or use your blood. Mei's voice was barely a squeak when she finished her explanations, making Izuku bring her into a full hug. He began patting her back, resting her head against his chest. He was aware of his flaws, it was something he had been trying to work on. It was why he had developed Flash Step, and why he so incessantly trained to be able to use warp as efficiently as possible, to avoid hurting himself, and bring back home troublesome news. He wished to be able to never make his mother may worry about him. He had failed countless times on that front, but still he worked hard. It seemed that it wasn't enough, as Mei found herself pushed into this type of corner. She loved to work on her original ideas and projects, always seeking inspiration and not imitation of other people's craft. Izuku turned his eyes to glance back at the weapons, hesitation clear on his face. He moved his hands to cup Mei by her cheeks, touching his forehead against hers. Thank you for them. I'll treasure them, and use them well. He found the words naturally flowing from him, no longer hesitant to display feelings for her. Mei smiled at him, and hugged him again. They spent some time like this, but the girl seemed to be growing a bit impatient at him. Well, aren't you going to try them? She asked him with eagerness, displayed all over her face. Izuku smiled at her enthusiasm, but made a show of rolling his eyes, almost as if to point out their location. That made the mechanic pout a bit. You don't need to shoot now, but you could at least grip them. Test how they feel, try it out. At least wear the holsters and see how they look like. Now that they had already talked about the heavy subjects, Mei found appropriate to talk about exciting things, to clear up the mood. Izuku released a sigh, but stood from the couch, and got close to the case. Now that the initial shock of seeing firearms had faded, he found himself somewhat excited at the prospect of holding a real gun. Having a blade like Night Edge was exciting, but a gun was a totally different matter altogether. 
Nevertheless, Izuku took a deep breath and slowly grasped one of the two firearms from the case. It resembled a pistol that he had seen on a few old wartime movies, something that usually was wielded at the Americans. It felt heavy, the smell of the metal and oil something he was a bit used to. Since he had to do maintenance on his blade after all, but it was a new and strange feeling holding the fire weapon. May began pointing out details from the weapon, teaching him how to load the magazine and the full details of this gun. It is a semi-automatic pistol, and should be fairly easy to clean and maintain. It should have fairly low recoil, and the safety mechanism is simple. The magazine for this one holds 10 rounds with one in the chamber, and I made everything from scratch. How does it feel? May enthusiastically explained to him, seeing Izuku try to get used to the weight and feel of the weapon on his hand. Does it have a name or something? He asked, trying to hold the weapon like he had seen Sniper Sensei do it. May nodded to him, handing him an empty magazine and clicking on the safety. I built it using the schematics for it. It doesn't have a name per se, but the model is called M1911. As she spoke, Izuku committed the name to memory, slowly and safely, as the girl guided him through, unloading the empty magazine and depositing the weapon back on the case. Izuku's gaze shifted to the second gun on the case. It was of a pretty silver-gray color, the body of a revolver unmistakable. The cylinder that would house six bullets, the bold design of the gun all, and the somewhat long barrel and thick barrel. It was something designed both for firepower as well as intimidation. The gun's design were a perfect mix of old and modern, the front part of the barrel, together with the cylinder, flicking down to reveal the chambers where ammunition would be placed instead of the usual design where the cylinder would be ejected to the side for reloading. He picked the revolver, the gun heavier than its previous counterpart. As he inspected the weapon, May hugged him from behind and leaned her head against his right shoulder, overlooking him as he fiddled with the firearm. That one is custom made. I designed it for heavy firepower, and I took into consideration a few of your powers when making it. This one is more experimental too, since I wasn't sure if my features would be able to be used. The pistol is more standard, something more run-of-the-mill, but this one is truly a baby after my heart. May explained, pointing to a few details of the revolver. True enough, Izuku captured a few of the finer details of this custom-made project. Two black lines ran through the length of the barrel until its end, the T not courageous enough to look inside the dangerous end. Surely there would be more surprises, but for now Izuku placed the gun back inside the case and closed it. I don't know what to say, May. Thank you. The vampire spoke, showing the girl a smile. May bloomed in joy, pulling a small blueprint from under the case. You'll fall in love with me even more when you try them out. Don't worry about running out of ammunition, I can make them easily on workshop class. Oh. I remembered the best part too. You can even use your own blood as munitions. As May suggested, Izuku frowned his brows at the suggestion. He hadn't really thought about such prospect. Well, not entirely. He had his blood spear burst, but outside of that Izuku hadn't thought about such thing. Which might seem foolish now, that he essentially was a bullet-making factory on his own, but before his knew he could take quirk factors for his own, using his blood as projectiles took too much concentration and finesse when they were javelin spear size. Much less when trying to make it bullet-shaped. He was about to put theory to test, but before he could, May shoved another set of boxes into his hands. He looked at them, finding the items inside to be his allowance of munitions. I was only allowed to make 30 rounds for the pistol and 18 rounds for the revolver each month, so please don't blow through them too fast. How Loader Sensei is still on the fence about them, so please be careful about their use. I have a few other projects I want to work on to give to you, so look forward to that. May explained, putting her hands behind her back and standing still, waiting for something. Izuku placed the boxes with the munitions over the case with his new weapons, and gave the girl a kiss, cupping her cheeks to hold her head in place. She moaned into the kiss, trying to work her tongue inside his mouth. The vampire cut the kiss short, making May whine and pouted him. He smirked at her, putting the idea of creating bullets out of him own blood on the back burner. What? Were you hoping for something else? He asked in a teasing tone, observing the girl squirming in place. Hatsume stayed silent, but it was clear that she had indeed was hoping for more. Izuku hummed, leaning back on the couch to relax. His hands motioned for the girl to join him, and thus she did, laying on top of his body and sharing some heat with him. He began peppering small kisses on her neck, hands slowly running their course over her lower back and hips. His fangs lightly teased at biting, yet not piercing skin. Merely a heated breath, pressing her body further against the hemomancer. The temperature between the two began to increase, their breathing deepening as excitement began to build up further. These past days the duo hadn't had the chance for intimacy as Skull had been cracking that hard on the students' backs. Now that they had some time together, Izuku wanted to catch up. Hi sweetie, I'm back. Mama Midoriya announced her entrance on the front door, cutting the previous mood immediately. The duo did not move from their spot, made burying her head against the vampire's chest, and doing her best to suddenly gain an invisibility quirk. 
The vampire took a deep breath, turning his head to see his mother enter the apartment and stand on the doorway. A smug smile plastered over her face as she looked over the teens. Sorry to bother. Inko whispered, putting one hand in front of her mouth to try to hide, not really, the smug expression she had. She made her way to the kitchen, whistling a good-humored tune. The vampire sighed, turning his head to look back at me. The girl had been waiting to meet his gaze, her face flushed with embarrassment instead of excitement. It was during moments like this, that the vampire hoped his beachfront house would be finished already. He loved his mother with all his heart, but goddamn was he annoyed when he got cock-blocked. Hey, would you look at that? Me, the creepy-looking kid, worried about having sex with my girlfriend. He mused to himself, patting May's head and hugging her closer to his body. The next day Izuku went to UA earlier, to register his new support items, and avoid a troublesome situation. He made his way to the teacher's room, holding the metallic case carefully. He knocked on the wooden door and waited for permission, receiving it from someone who clearly was sleeping deprived. Aizawa was sensei for sure, Izuku mused as he entered the room. His guess was correct, for the most part of it. The stealth hero could be found on a corner of the room, inside his toasty cocoon, and lazily looking over some papers, while on the ground. He wasn't alone in the room, though, as Midnight and Cementus were also there looking over their work. The teachers glanced at him, offering nods of acknowledgement and returning to their work. Izuku returned the nod, carrying his case close to his homeroom teacher. Aizawa looked up to Izuku, his tired eyes staying longer on the case that Izuku was carrying. The teacher returned his gaze back to the teen, already waiting for an explanation. Problem child, an explanation. Izuku preferred to simply put the suitcase over what he supposed to be Aizawa's table. After depositing the item over the table, the vampire offered the teacher a slip of paper that May had given to him before. Aizawa slowly grabbed the paper, eyes running over the words and staying silent for a while. The self-pro lowered the paper together with the remaining ones he had, closed his eyes and huffed in annoyance. Do you know how to use these? Izuku nodded. I have some knowledge over their use, but I was also thinking of asking Sniper Sensei for instruction. His answer made the teacher release a grunt. What the noise meant? Only God knew. Considering that the vampire wasn't wrapped up like a mummy or under the terrifying court-canceling gaze of his homeroom teacher, Izuku took the noise as something akin to approval. We will have a special heroics class exercise this week, so if you plan to use them get proper instruction soon and get a pass from Sniper. Also, the first term's finals are coming up, so make sure to study up. I know things have been somewhat hectic, but if you need counseling or anything else, you know who to search. Aizawa commented in his offhand type of way. Izuku nodded, making his way out of the room to go to class. As the vampire left, Aizawa let out another sigh, this time more audible. His work comrades looked over at the man, Cementus, knowing that asking too much would only worsen the mood of his fellow pro hero. Midnight on the other hand was more than happy to bother the man. Sounds like someone is getting overly worried about his kid. If I were to guess, I'd say. The rated heroine tease, making Aizawa stand from his position, and leave the confines of his sleeping bag. Not now, Kayama. I don't need this so early in the morning. The pro exclaimed, sitting on the chair in front of his desk and inspecting the items inside. He opened the case and hummed, checking over the weapons. Kayama Namiri, Aka Midnight, stood from her workspace and strutted her way to Eraserhead's desk. She leaned against his shoulder in a lazy way, pressing her breasts against his back, and checking unashamedly the contents of Izuku's suitcase. Aizawa slowly moved his eyes to look annoyed at the invasion of his private space by the woman. He luckily gained his personal space back, when the heroine teacher backed away from the case with white eyes. Are those? Namiri asked in clear surprise, looking at Shota with narrowed eyes. Aizawa nodded, showing surprising familiarity with the firearms as he racked the slide of the pistol, loading one of the empty magazines, and inspecting the gun on its entirety. The ammunition box had live rounds, the unshaven man pondering his thoughts for a while about the idea of letting the vampire have live rounds like this. The kid is smart enough to not point these things carelessly, and power loader vouched for him. He also has quite the tendency to put himself into some troublesome situations, points for him for bringing them here first, instead of just firing them away and training suddenly. Let's see how he does with rubber rounds first, then we will see. Aizawa tapped a few sticky notes with Izuku's name on the boxes of ammunition, before he stored them away in one of his drawers. He stood from his desk, marching to one that had a cowboy hat on it. Fumbling with the drawers of the desk, Aizawa found one of them locked. Sighing, the teacher kneeled by the desk and pulled something from his pocket. Are you just going to do that while we watch you and pretend this is not happening? Kayama asked, hoping to get the collaboration of her fellow teacher. She was annoyed when Cementus just fixed his pile of papers and made his exit from the room. For a living block of concrete, the man was certainly agile. Do you have anything to add to this conversation, Eraser? The pro grumbled under his breath, finally unlocking the drawer and opening it. From inside it Aizawa pulled a few other small boxes, all of them rattling with the slight sound of metal colliding with metal. Are you seriously just nicking bullets from Snipe? 
I didn't know you were this snotty about doing things for your protege. The heroine tried once more to get a rise out of Shota, the man rolling his eyes at the statement from his fellow teacher. Snap knows, I sent him a text just now. If the pro was lying, it was one of the worst ones that Midnight had heard. And believe her, she had heard some terrible half-truths from both students and villains she had faced. That or Aizawa truly had a god-tier poker face poker voice, which she would not discard the possibility of, as he had won his fair share of bets when the teachers did their monthly reunion for a few games. Sure sure, you do you. The heroine knew that trying to talk with Aizawa when he didn't wish to be spoken to was a challenge. One that she honestly had little chance of winning, unless she pestered him with some womanly charm, which, in turn, would piss him off, and he'd hopefully drop some info just in hopes to get her off his case. It was a tactic she had seen him use countless times when his future would-be wife Ms. Jo came over to visit or when they met due to some circumstance. Namuri really wanted to see them together, if only to clean off the mean mug that Eraserhead would carry with him constantly. Would it kill the man to shave and look presentable once in a while? However, she was digressing from her original thoughts. The woman gathered her own things to get ready for her class. She needed to get those 1C kids ready for their lesson. The heroine exited the room, bidding the pro farewell with his endeavors. God knew he would need if Shota was calling Midoriya his problem child. That term of endearment was reserved only a few students, the last ones she could remember having had the title swapped it for a better sounding one. The big three of UAs certainly sounded much better than Aizawa's three problem children. The bell that finished present mix English lesson echoed, allowing the students to release tired groans and get ready for lunch. Some were already exiting the class to get their meals, leaving only a few last stragglers. Among those that stayed behind, Izuku was one of them. The vampire stretched his arms up, craning his neck sideways to let out a cracking noise, as well as a relieved huff. He picked a cloth-wrapped box from his backpack, his meal today being a homemade bento of pickled plums and rice, with a side of steamed mackerel fillet, salad and some miso soup. To top off, he also brought a thermos flask filled with his special nutrition. The vampire had been avoiding the cafeteria these days, a bit annoyed over the quantity of hushed whispers that would echo around when he was present there. To avoid this, he had been making his own meals home and bringing them over. Blunkrish's food was amazing, but there was something good too about eating your own cooking. He was no master chef, but he was confident in his simple meals, Amuris being one of his best dishes. May never cooked, since the vampire was sure that if he were to allow the mechanic to remain alone in his kitchen for even a short period of time, he would come back to a hellish sight for sure, as machinery would try to hunt him down for his mere existence. Dark thoughts about terrible sci-fi futures furniture aside, Izuku also took a few books aside to review some content. It was fairly easy for him to eat and study at the same time, the tendrils of dark mass and tentacles of bloody could create making for fairly useful temporary limbs. There was, unfortunately, the side effect that it looked like a Lovecraftian horror had spawned in class and looked ready to devour the souls of the living and then destroy reality as humans knew it, but hey, what is life without some cosmic horror to spook you? Finishing his food, Izuku kept on reviewing his notes and reading through some of his material when the sound of footsteps caught his attention. Normally he would ignore those, there were countless students in the school building after all, but his senses alerted him of a familiar presence. There was also the scent of lavender hiding the hints of tobacco smoke, the small something he was familiar when associating it to this person. Jirokiyoka. The girl approached Izuku slowly, her steps measured and careful. The vampire wondered what did the girl wanted, closing his current notebook and turning his head to meet Kiyoka's eyes. She gave him a shy smile, almost admonishing herself for thinking she could sneak by the vampire. Hello there. Izuku greeted the girl. Kiyoka closed the distance and sat atop a desk in front of Izuku. He managed to keep his eyes from wandering down the very inviting valley of the girl's soft-looking thighs, as the height of the tables in the class made so that when Kiyoka sat on it, his eyes would be at a perfect angle for a peek. Yo, resorting to hiding away in the class now. The girl teased a bit in her good manner, the vampire taking it in good manner as he packed his empty lunchbox away. How may I help you, Kiyoka-san? The vampire asked, ignoring her little jab at his lunch spot. The girl stayed silent for a while, took a breath, and then decided to ask her a quest. So, I was thinking your grades are up there with Yamomo and stuff, and I needed some help in modern hero history and algebra. With the first term exams coming up, I need a little pick-me-up on that, and I wondered if you have any tips for training, can you help me out? The punk rocker asked in a shy tone, making that little spark of sadism inside Izuku lit up. His lips slipped into a smirk, but the vampire managed to keep himself in check. He took a pensive pose, hands slipping under his chin to hold his head up as he stared at the girl. Kyoka squirmed a bit under the intense gaze of the vampire, already building some sassy remark in her mind to shoot back at him when he opened his mouth. It seemed that Izuku had been changing from the usual quiet kid mood to a quiet teaser that wouldn't miss the chance to crack a joke or tease her over some menial stuff. She would almost say she liked the change, except she was normally the one whom he'd set his sight to tease. 
Sure, that will be no problem. Izuku spoke, gauging the reaction of his female classmate. The girl almost let go of the sarcastic remark she had been building up, only for her mind to process the information and a smile to bloom on her face. Really? I mean, if you've got stuff to do I understand. No need to skip on your stuff for me. Izuku nodded with a smile also present on his lips. Yes, it will be no problem. Send me a message with your free timetable, and I'll schedule something suitable. He explained, sensing the approach of other people back to the classroom. He took a sip from his flask to quench a bit of his thirst, smacking his lips to fade the crimson tint that remained. The sliding door to the class opened up to reveal the self-denominated Baku squad. The group consisted of those that had been picked up by Bakugo during the cavalry event, and those that cared little for his humor. The teens hanging around the explosive boy even when he continuously cursed and complained about their presence near him. Hiroshima, Kaminari, Sero, Ashido and Toru entered the room together with the explosive ash blonde, their eyes naturally drawn to the two already inside the place. Ashido immediately rushed to meet the vampire and the rocker girl, her smug grin plastered all over her face. Oh, what do we have here? Are we interrupting something important? We can come back later if you want. The pink-skinned girl began her spiel, making Jiro groan at the other highly spirited girl. While that happened, Kaminari and Kirishima exchanged looks, the Radid wondering if the electric teen had anything to say. Thank you Salt, playing it cool as he tried to discreetly spy on the conversation of his neighbors. Bakugo clearly could not be bothered with a, in his highly garnished opinion, idiotic talk and moved to his seat. Which so happened to be the desk Kyuka had been sitting on. Move, dangly ears. Your ass is on my spot. With all the subtlety of a steam locomotive, Bakugo announced his presence to the trio. Jiro glanced at him with annoyed eyes, but to avoid having Katsuki go into one of his rants, she did a tiny hop from his table. There, your majesty. Sarcasm thick on her words, the girl moved away from the ever so pleasant bomber. The boy scoffed, but took his seat without any fuss, and pulled out his phone to avoid having to deal with others. Not that his wish was granted, as Kirishima soon approached him. That was not very manly, Bakubro. A manly man is always willing to let a girl have his seat. And profanity is a no-go. Kirishima preached, crossing his arms over his chest and nodding to himself, feeling good about having spread the word of a manly man. Katsuki clicked his tongue and rolled his eyes at the redeed. The fuck did you say, shitty hair? What the fuck are you now, my old hag? This bitch wants to sit her skinny ass, she can pick her own damn table to sit on. The bomber answered, clearly unbothered by the angry stare of the rocker. He was about to retort to the girl, but found himself under a second set of eyes. Crimson slits inside pulls of inky blackness. His own red orb stared firmly into the vampire's gaze, challenging the monster to do something. Tension built up as the two heavy hitters of Wana kept their stares firm into each other. The only thing dispersing the built-up mood, the sound of the sliding door opening once more. The arrows and Momo entered the room together with the Ida, the two exchanging study tips when they noticed the mood of the class. The young heiress instantly clammed up, leaving Tini talking alone until he eyed the class. Midoriya kun. Just the person I was looking for too. The teen with glasses made his way to the vampire seemingly unaffected by the current class mood, and began to move and chop his arms akin to a robot. I was just having an enlightening conversation with Yoyorozu san about our class, and I noticed that some of our fellow students seem to be having some difficulty when studying for certain classes. As fellow top academic students, it is our job to assist those with difficulty to increase their grades and clean their act. A few students moaned and complained at the mention of grades, painfully aware of their troubles when it came to their academics. Yue seemed to take a rather sadistic joy in pulling up homework on top of their usual heroics classes and training, which for some of the less enthusiastic diligent students meant lower grades. Aizawa sensei particularly drove hard into their skulls the point of academics in their lives. Izuka let his gaze linger over the bomber for a while, moving his now green emerald orbs over the taller teen. I was. The vampire quickly shifted his gaze over the rocker, seeing a bit of an embarrassed flush paint her features. Just thinking that I myself needed to head the books before my homework piles up. With the first terms coming up soon, it would not trouble me to help whoever has troubles with something, so long as I can help. Izuku stated, seeing Kyoka release a relieved sigh. Bashido, Kirishima and Kaminari whooped in joy, the pink-skinned girl launching herself at Momo and hugging the girl. Then, we have to, no, we need to have Ya Momo with us. She is the number one in class for most subjects. The praise from the pink ball of excitement called Mino Ashido made the black-haired beauty blush. Momo tried to pass the praise as something anyone could do with enough effort. Mina intensified her hug, putting most of her weight over the taller girl, and began to beg into a childish tone. Please, please, please. Help us, oh great Momo-sama. We shall dedicate our lowly lives for our goddess. As Mina sweetened Momo with some good all praise and boot licking, Kaminari kneeled on the spot and began to pray, Hiroshima soon by his side, offering their unending servitude. Well, if it is not a bother to anyone, we can use my house for this study section. 
I'll prepare tea and some appropriate snacks, so that we can focus on what everyone needs to improve. The heiress seemed to be overjoyed at the prospect of having her classmates over, the fantasy of friendship making the girl almost glow in happiness. Izuku began massaging his neck awkwardly, wondering if he should burst the bubble of joy the girl had built for herself. His relationship with the girl had stagnated into that of tolerance. She only spoke to him when absolutely necessary, and receiving an invitation to study in her home was one thing outside of the necessary absolute that she had set for herself. He wondered if the girl had realized the fact herself, but considering she was still in cloud nine after the praise shower she had received, the vampire opted to keep quiet for now. After school he could ask to talk with her with the excuse of student president vice president work. She might dislike him, and be under the delusion that he was a lust riddle fiend out to drink their virgin blood, but Momo was too serious to avoid student related matters work. Kyuka sent him a nod, to which she blinked one eye in a light manner. The punk girl rolled her eyes, and mouthed a thank you to him. After a few more minutes, the rest of the class returned, and then Aizawa appeared to take them away for the day's torter, Hiroko's class. The vampire left Hound Dog's classroom and stretched his numb extremities, checking his phone to make sure he wasn't dumped alone by the rich heirs. Surprisingly, the girl had answered his text and confirmed that she was waiting for him by the library. He made his way to her, glad that the girl was compliant and comprehensible, or so he imagined. As he reached Yue's library, the modern architecture of the place making the vampire wonder if he was in a library or an expensive high-class hotel, his eyes scanned the almost empty library. The smell of wood polish and pressed paper made him somewhat nostalgic, his days alone back in middle school passing quickly in his mind, a melancholic feeling making the vampire sigh to himself. He took a deep breath, his nose catching a whiff of blood. It wasn't enough to stimulate his thirst, hell, not even enough to be from something like a paper cut. Yet, it was still there, a familiar scent that the vampire could almost taste in his mouth, and one of the quirk factors that he had unlocked his secrets. He followed the scent, aware of whom it belonged to. Izuku found the girl on an isolate corner of the library, a few piles of books around her on a coffee table, as she also read through the contents of a chemistry book. The vampire coughed, gaining the girl's attention to him. The girl closed the book with a dull thud, placing her book over on the table, and directing her gaze to him. Midoriya-san. The heiress greeted him politely, although you could detect some hostility in her tone. Izuku already knew this sing a song, all that he had to do was dance to her tune. Yeroza-san, good evening. He toned his voice and maintained a poker face, trying to avoid a troublesome or loud discussion inside the library. He kept standing, even when there were available spaces somewhat far from the girl, while still maintaining her within earshot distance. The girl kept her gaze at him leveled, her brows furrowing a bit, seeing the vampire maintain his distance. She also kept her gaze away from his pupils, aware of his hypnotic powers. The green-haired teen rolled his eyes, closing his eyelids and fine-tuning his hearing sense. His hearing became sensitive, the vampire now able to even hear the heiress's rhythmic heartbeats. Slightly elevated, is she nervous? He mused, somewhat missing the range of expressions he could read on the girl's face. He had to make it do with her heart rate and what he could hear from her tone, as well as any other sense she would release unconsciously. Are you comfortable now? He asked, holding back on the sarcasm. It seemed to be effective, as Momo's heartbeat slowed to a normal rate. She coughed a bit to clear her throat, the vampire hearing the shuffle of clothing as she fixed her sitting position. Well? Why have you called me here? I suspect it has something to do with the events that happened earlier in class. Your excuse of work-related matters was poor at best. Yorozu said in her usual tone. The vampire nodded, keeping his eyes still shut. Indeed. I knew it was a subpar excuse, but in the end it seems to have worked out, you are here after all. Izuku pointed out, noticing the small gasp that exited the girl. Curiosity got the best of me, I admit, but it still hasn't explained why you have called me here. Izuku once more nodded to her. I know that you are afraid of me, Yorozu said. Don't bother trying to deny it, I can smell it off you. He couldn't really, but she didn't know that. His sense of smell was good, but not yet to that level. I don't know why, and to be honest, I do not care for your reasons. As Iida-kun suggested helping our classmates, I agreed to it, and you offered your own home for the matter. I just want to assure you that nothing wrong will happen to either you or any of the other girls. He stated, but the following noise made the vampire doubt his own hearing. Yoyorozu scoffed. The prim and proper princess of the Yoyorozu scoffed at him. If Izuku wasn't surprised by it, he'd say he was impressed at her. Words are cheap and plenty, Midoriya-san. I shall allow you to have access to my house, but the very second that you act out of conduct, you shall feel the fury of the Yoyorozu family falling down on you. I admit that your intellect is great, but do not feel special. You are to merely help our classmates, any attempts at sweet-talking or seducing, will be corrected on this spot. The declarations of the girl were firm, and in the silence of the library her words echoed strongly. Izuku nodded, aware that like with the bar Shiazaki, trying to butt heads against the girl would not work. Very well. He opted for a short response, untrusting his own mouth to not betray him, and released the words that he truly wished to say. 
Baby steps, Izuku. Baby steps. He chanted to himself, calming the anger that bubbled to his mind. Iroz's tone implied that she still believed her made-up fantasies about him to be truth, but he could not flow against the sea of her current convictions, else he'd destroy his current progress and harm his relationship with not only the heirs, but Jiro. In honesty, he was fine with maintaining this work-only relation with the black-haired girl. However, she was Kyoka's best friend here, and tension between Izuku and Momo would inevitably spark tension between him and Kyoka. He preferred to not be the one, to spoil his few friendships over bad blood. Better to mend the current bridge than to scorch everything. The matter of his visit to Yoyorozu's house completed, the vampire turned his back on the girl and waved her farewell. After he left the library, the black-haired beauty released a tense sigh, her hands dropping a hidden taser from their grasp. I'll not fall for honeyed words, Midoriya. Friday came for the students, the prospect of less academics and more heroics, uplifting the mood of the entire Wana class. It seemed that today would be something along the lines of a rescue trial, Aizawa allowing the students to grab their hero costumes and make their way to training grounds Gamma. As Izuku picked up his own case, he noticed his teacher's gaze upon him. The vampire turned to meet the man's eyes, questioning the reason for the pro's focus on him. Aizawa kept his silence for a while, huffing air once he felt that Itin would not back away. You got those extra lessons with Snap like we talked. I have been introduced to the basics of everything. I wouldn't be performing trick shots anytime soon, but intimidation should still work just fine. It is not a toy after all. Eraser had allowed one of his rare creepy smiles to slip his lips into a psychotic grin. Are you a problem child? The pro commented, approaching the teen. He knocked on the metallic case with his knuckles. Since that's the case, you wouldn't mind that I switch the live rounds with rubber ones, will you? Izuku shook his head, giving a fanged smile back to his teacher. I don't mind it at all, sir. Rubber rounds hurt quite enough on their own. Get to the lockers already, kid. The pro also shook his head, this time in quite a good-mannered way. Also, tell the Hatsume brat from 1H to send your live rounds to my desk until second order. I'm serious about that one, kid. Until I know I can fully trust you with those things you don't get to walk around with real fire. It is one thing for you to have a blade, and the other is a firearm. Do not make me regret this, Midoriya. The second half of their conversation took on a more serious tone, one which Izuku also responded in a serious manner. Yes sir. With that, Izuku made his way to the locker room for the males. It was still full with his classmates putting on their gear, the vampire quirked to also dress up. Shedding his school uniform and putting on his clean gear made him happy. It was strange to describe, but the weight of his costume felt well on his back. And now that he had additions, he couldn't help but feel giddy. He finished buttoning up his reinforced long-sleeved white shirt and vest, now picking up the holster harnesses for his new weapons. There were two of them, both synthetic and colored black, one of the holsters went on his right hip, while the other was strapped across, and just over the left side of chest, ironically right over his heart. He loaded the 1911 with a magazine, confirming the fact that Aizawa's sensei had indeed replaced his live munitions with rubber rounds, as their previously copper-tinted metal tips now were hard blue color. Izuku quickly packed two more magazines into his pockets and holstered the pistol, wearing his coat and hiding the weapon from sight. He finished his buttons on the coat and grabbed the revolver. Since he had had some practice with snipe, reloading the revolver wasn't that hard to do. It would be troublesome to keep on loading bullet per bullet on the weapon, hence the reason Mei had also made a few speed loaders for it. He wondered if he would even need those, considering that his revolver was chambered into what Mei described to be .454 castle rounds, which according to the girl, would be more than a match for most things would dare trying to harm him. She called it the Ghana hand cannon. He did some research on the matter, and the results scared even him. Even now with rubber rounds, Izuku found himself hesitant to even carry the powerful weapon with him. In the end, he still loaded the rounds and holstered the revolver into the chest holster. He didn't know if it was luck, but it seemed that none of his classmates saw him holstering the weapons, neither did they seem to perceive his concealed carry. Izuku normally would make use of Blink to get to the training grounds, but he spotted Yuraka and Suyu talking with Iida on the hallway, seemingly waiting for someone. As he walked close to the group, the trio gave their greetings. Izuku-kun. Hi, Midoriya-chan. Midoriya-kun, it is nice to see that your costume wasn't damaged. He got closer, offering a hand wave to everyone. Hello there. His greeting got a chuckle from the brunette. The now four people group continued making their way to the training grounds. Is there anything funny about my greeting, Yuraka-san? The vampire asked with a raised brow, looking at the brown-haired girl with his green pupils. She managed to get her chuckles in control, looking at her frog friend, before returning her warm brown eyes to Izuku's frame. I don't really know, Izuku-kun. It is just that the way you say it, it seems almost like you're about to start some business deal or become a diplomat all of a sudden. I just find it really funny. The Machi lover explained, Suyu by her side assuming a pensive pose, and nodding to her friend's explanation as she looked at Izuku from his boots until head. The vampire blinked his eyes, trying to find the supposed funny energy from the girl's explanation. 
As the point still eluded him, he turned to Ida to help him try to make sense of it. When the taller teen was of no help, the hemomancer contented himself with making the girls laugh, whatever be the reason. Tsuyu decided to throw him a bone. It is just that, Midoriya Chan, you are always so serious and seemingly always playing the straight man act, yet you are just saying simple things. The contrast between those extremes makes it funny, at least for me. It is almost like Ida Kun, but he is too stiff. Blunt as usual, the froggy girl delivered her message with her usual, loopy smiley face that made reading her a challenge. Now that got Izuku thinking. The game of poker between him, Shoto, Tsuyu and Aizawa's sensei, would be a challenging match. Maybe if he could convince Cementus sensei to join in, they could make it a match of poker face pros. His thoughts about card games aside, Izuku pointed back at Tsuyu. You could also make the part a decent straight man act, Tsuyu-san. Your bluntness can be surprising for those that aren't expecting it, and your cute voice can deliver a shocking message without even thinking about it. That seemed to do the trick, as the frog girl seemed to become stunned under his praise of her acting skill. Her cheeks became rosy, Tsuyu so avoiding his face for a moment. Yuraka on the other hand, managed to maintain her smile, although the vampire could detect none of the previous sweetness she had displayed. Aida seemed to agree with his assessment, so that made the vampire question the brunette's almost shift of mood. Tsu chan got Saki voice, huh? Now that got Izuku questioning Yuraka even further. My accent slips only happened among the Yurakas during a few occasions. Either they were among family and close friends, extremely happy about something or angry at something in particular. Now, Izuku was no expert in people or relationships, but he knew the brown-haired gravity girl in front of him. She was hard to anger, and had a fairly good hold on her accent when around school, so that got the vampire to hold the last option as the only one available. She was angry. And considering that Tsuyu was busy looking away from him and walking ahead of the group, and Ida found the need to expand on the explanation of their previous words about the froggy girl, Izuku was left with one angry machi girl. Now he could simply ignore the girl, and her sudden bout of anger, considering that he had seen Kitten's demeanor looks, and Yuraka looked as intimidating as a bowl of vanilla ice cream, but the vampire opted to face the puffy cheek girl. Come on, Yuraka-san, there is no need to get angry over something this minor. He stated, hoping to pacify the girl. His words, however, seemed to have the exact opposite effect of his intent as the girl's pout increased, and she seemed ready to throw him into orbit. Now, how was he going to get out of this one? He was going to say something else, but the brunette cut him before he could do so. I didn't think Izuku-kun was this type of skirt chaser. You just as go and throw wind compliments at girls until one falls for you. I did not take you for a womanizer, Izuku-kun. The brunette threw quite some heat over the vampire, childish anger tinting her voice in that tone. That tone that young children did when they were angry, but could not explain what they were angry at. Childish or not, it still wasn't something that the vampire was going to take lying down. He closed the distance between him and the girl, making so that she would have to look up in order to meet his eyes. That got her to immediately quiet down, although you could still see fire in her eyes. Now I know that my looks can be scary, Yuraka-san. However, calling me a womanizer is going over the limits of my tolerance quite a bit. His voice was deep and firm, the vampire making sure that the message would stick to the girl. She flinched, but he could still sense defiance as Yuraka still wanted to argue her point. What's with you? You're always looking at another gal, and you haven't said a pretty thing about me in forever. The bubbly girl whisper shouted at him. She realized what she said and immediately shut her mouth with her hands and avoided his eyes. Why did I say that? Now he is going to be super mad at me. The girl chastised herself in her mind, almost running away to meet the other two. Before she could, the vampire managed to secure her by her wrist. Is that why you are angry? He asked in a neutral tone, his annoyance from her earlier words dissipating rather easily. Or... He hesitated a bit, unsure if what he was going to say would be true or just a projection of his ego. Are you jealous? If her face wasn't red before, now she was sure that she was doing her best impression of a tomato, her cheeks burning wildly, and her stomach tying in knots. Yet, she could not find it in her the wish to deny his question, turning it into an affirmation. The silence between them made the blush dusting their faces only more obvious. Izuka released his hold on the girl's wrist, their walking filling in what would be their conversation. The vampire wasn't sure what to say in this type of situation. Neither did Yuraka. He scratched the back of his neck, looking away from the girl and trying to come up with a solution for their current predicament. A few more moments passed, the distance to the training ground shortening quickly. The vampire turned his head to her once more, clearing his throat to garner Yuraka's attention, but the girl was already acting her own idea. You're a cheater, Izuku-kun. You make girls feel funny and then you do nothing else, making them wonder a thousand things in their heads, and then you don't act on any of those. What am I supposed to do with these weird thoughts, huh? Yuraka pulled the vampire by the lapel of his overcoat, and whispered the words close to Izuku's right ear, her hot breath tickling him and sending shivers running down his arms. You drank my blood once, and it is making me wish to do that again, but then you never ask for it even when you need it. 
It is all jumbled together in my head, and I think that I'm the weird one when I want you to do it again. A low growling echoed inside Izuku's head, the Hemomancer stunned into silence by the sudden act of the brunette. She released her hold on his coat and made haste to flee from him, quickly catching up to Ida and Suyu, that left the Hemomancer behind, the vampire feeling his fangs itch with the familiar thirst that sprung when he was around me. The future is strangely bright for us, a being that thrives in the shadows. How about another taste of that girl, master? Surely that Nomu wasn't enough. Just a tad will be fine, right? The teen ignored his lieutenant, his wild side releasing a throaty laugh that faded away as the vampire reached the training grounds. Luckily, everyone from his class have already arrived. The vampire did a quick headcount, trying to put the conversation with Yuraka on the back burner for now. He spotted his teacher, the pro hero sporting a mean mug for a face as he held his phone close to his ear. The racer had huffed, holding the device against his ear by leaning on left shoulder, his hands running over his face, as he attempted to maintain a semblance of calmness, due to the foolish man who called himself a teacher. All might have done it again. Whatever the American-themed hero was doing, he ended up using the time he could be in his heroic muscle form, and now could not stand in front of the students to give the lecture he was supposed to. The pissed Aizawa tremendously, the lack of commitment the blonde hero to be a teacher, was impressive on its own right. All Might did not program his classes, he was always leaning on the other staff to bail him out of troublesome situations, and it seemed that most of the time the man was busier making his hair stand up, and teeth shine, instead of learning the ropes to be a teacher for these teens. The self-pro tried very hard to not release a wave of murderous intent all around him, reining in his anger and contacting another pro. Thankfully, his contact picked up almost instantly. Vlad speaking. The voice on the other side of the phone answered. Aizawa grunted, running one hand along the bridge of his nose. Hey Vlad, it is me, Eraserhead. I need a favor. The teacher that was supposed to oversee the lesson for one of today is unable to come, and I'm not exactly a rescue specialist. Thirteen is still recuperating from her injuries, so if you could help me out, I'd owe you one a favor. I need an activity for my brats for today. The homeroom teacher for 1B whistled out, chuckling into his phone. Being owed a favor by you. Count mean. Give me a few minutes to get my class up and running. My brats have been somewhat restless for a couple of days. We can still salvage the original exercise, just add some brawling, and the brats will entertain themselves. As soon as Vlad confirmed his presence, Shota cut the call short. A tired girl left the black-clad pro, who took a melanin pack from one of his many hidden pockets, and drained the contents of it with impressive speed. After releasing another side the pro called the attention of his students. Listen, because I won't repeat myself. There has been a change of plans, All Might won't be able to come today, so we'll have a joint activity with Class 1B and Vlad King. Warm up and wait for them. Yoyorozu, Midoriya, directed and meet the incoming students. Almost as if he was done with life itself, the pro simply plopped down in his current place and curled into a ball to sleep. Izuku searched for the class president, finding the girl busy pleasantly talking with Jiro. He made his way to them, boots making some noise as he walked on gravel. The training grounds Gamma was an industrial setup, lined with many factories and chemical plants. If his thoughts were right, the exercise would probably be traversing the place without damaging the place, as chemical plants were highly dangerous grounds. As he walked closer to the heiress and the rocker girl, the duo noticed his approach. Kyoka waved at him and smiled while Momo glanced at the side. Hello there, Kyoka-san, Yuirosu-san. Hey Izuku. Good afternoon Midoriya-san. A normal greeting and a lukewarm one at best, he would take it, especially after his last conversation with the black-haired heiress. Kyoka-san, do you mind if I borrow the class president for a while? We need to get everyone to stretch out, you heard Aizawa-sensei. The vampire pointed out, seeing Jiro nod. The rocker gave the two a wave and moved to talk with other groups, leaving the duo on their own. The vampire looked at the taller girl, seeing she still avoid his gaze. Some irritation threatened to bubble up in his face, but the hemomancer controlled himself. Let's not make this more awkward than it has to be, right? It is just guiding a few warm-up exercises, nothing to get worked up on. The heiress nodded, compassing herself and taking a deep breath. Right? Shall we proceed? I'll help the girls, you instruct the guys. Momo spoke and began to approach the females. Izuka rolled his eyes, but made no further comments. Thankfully, some of the boys were already doing stretches, which made Izuku's job easier. Ten minutes passed, and Izuku could now hear the footsteps of the other class approaching their group. He stopped his half-baked stretches, already pretty stretched out, and searched among the bodies for those whom he knew. Thankfully, Kendo stood out quite a bit in her hero costume. The blue kai pout dress and face mask seemed to mesh perfectly with her orange hair and teal orbs, making a combo almost irresistible for him, not to stare at her. The girl seemed to have felt his gaze on her, as she turned her head to search for him too. Their eyes met, the girl's orbs widening a bit in surprise before she started to make her way towards him. Izuku nodded to her, searching Yairozu to have the girls meet, and greet as fellow class presidents. 
He found her helping a Chaco stretch, the brunette clearly bothered by the almost complete split she was being forced to do. Momo-chan, I don't think I can go beyond this. It is too much. Yuraka whined, panting a bit to try and forget some of the pain running through her tights. Unfortunately for her, Yuirozu seemed deaf to her complaints. yuraka san this is for your own good. Flexibility is something required for us, so the sooner you get used to this the better. The black-haired heiress explained and pushed on the girl's lower back to help her complete the split. Echeko was about to complain once more, however her saving grace came in the form of her vampire friend. Since they were on the ground doing the stretch, the vampire shadowed them with his height. Yuirozu turned to see who had approached them, almost flinching as she saw the code of the Hemomancer. Midoriya-san, what can I assist you with? The heiress asked while standing up, and helping Echeko to her feet, the brunette giving her friend the stink eye as she massaged her own tights to ease some of the tension there. The vampire remained silent, but moved a few inches to the side to give the taller girl a sight of the approaching class. Momo hummed in acknowledgement and began to walk in front of him to greet the incoming students. Izuku glanced at Yuraka, a silent question on his face to the girl. Yuraka blushed under his gaze, avoiding his eyes and bringing one hand to her face, chewing on a finger to avoid releasing a squeak. He quickly glanced at Yuirozu, seeing that the girl was still halfway through walking, and turned back to Uchako. Do you want some heat pads for the soreness later? You won't get out of bed tomorrow if you don't use it. He offered the girls some help, pushing their earlier conversation to the deep recesses of his mind. Echeko blinked at him, noticing that he had some red dusting his cheeks, but was doing his best to help her out. The girl answered with a smile. I'd like that very much so, Izuku-kun. The offer of his help accepted, he turned to find Momo had reached Itsuka and a blonde teen dressed in a rather fancy suit for a costume. Izuku had heard some comments about him flying around class just after the school festival, something about the boy being either jealous or antagonistic towards them for some reason. He had had a conversation with Shizaki Bara during his internship with Edshot, where the girl had mentioned his name too, but so far Izuku had very few details about the teen, apart from that one time where he had antagonized Izuku after his victory over the vine-haired girl, thus. The vampire decided to reserve judgment until he fully spoke with the boy. Approaching the group, the Hemomancer wondered a bit as to why All Might wasn't around to give the lesson. Eraser had Sensei had yet to give a reason for the sudden change on the class's activities, going so far as to call their sister class to make their training a joint effort. From the corner of his eye, Izuku could see Vlad Sensei talking with Aizawa, the two just far enough to be out of his hearing range. In the end, Izuku shrugged to himself. There would be no end to his musings if he were to stop and wonder why the top hero of Japan wasn't present. Maybe it had to do with the supposed injury the American-themed pro had, or it might be another matter altogether. The important thing would be for him to focus into his presence. Walking faster, he soon reached the three-person group of class representatives. Hello there. He gave his standard greeting, seeing Kendo give him a pleasant smile back while Monoma on her set put on a gentleman's facade. Good afternoon, Midoriya Izuku-san. I haven't had the pleasure of truly meeting you before outside of some friendly competition, and thus would like to extend my most wonder-filled greetings to a fellow class vice president. Kendo-san and I were making acquaintances with your class president, and I must say that your class must feel truly blessed to be led by such incredible person as Yoyorozu san here. Monoma greeted Izuku with manners the vampire had only heard in his mother's posh and humorous late-night TV novels. The other teen even bowed at the waist, one hand neatly placed over his chest as he finished his bow and offered Izuku a well-practiced smile. The vampire quickly glanced at Kendo, the girl sporting a wry smile and an awkward look in her eyes. To avoid needless conflict between the classes, Izuku decided to answer in kind. He extended a hand, making sure his claws were short and blunt, to greet the blonde teen. Good afternoon, Manama-san. It is a pleasure to meet you for this joint class, and we hope to have a productive lesson with you all. I know we have our differences, but let's work hard so that we can improve ourselves. Izuku avoided speaking too politely, to avoid sound patronizing, or overly familiar, to avoid sounding rude, having learned his lesson long ago when he used Kaigo speech with Yoyorozu. We are very thankful too, being helped by someone of Yoyorozu sense caliber. I know that class 1B themselves must be thankful for your guidance over them. Monoma kept his gentle face, grasping Izuku's hand and firmly holding it as they exchanged greetings. The Hemomancer did not let show in his face, but he felt a weird static happen when his skin touched that of the male in front of him, a long echo of a roar sounding at the back of his head. The blonde teen smiled and released the green-haired boy's hand, turning to his class president and pointing to one of his many watches. How the time flies, right? Kendo-san, we must get going. It seems that Vlad and Aizawa sensei have finished their talks. Yoyorozu-san, Midoriya-san, we shall see each other soon. 
Cutting the martial artist girl before she had time to talk with the vampire, Manama dragged the girl away and left Izuku and Momo alone. The heiress seemed pleased to have made acquaintances with the other class members, her tension from being close to him mostly forgotten as they made their way their classmates, Aizawa, and Vlad King now beginning to explain the new exercise they would be doing. The no child left behind race would consist of a simple challenge. The three members of a team had to reach the goal to win. The teams could run interference on their adversaries, but the major point of the race was to reach the goal, with all the members hale enough, so that they could accomplish their work of rescuing a VIP. Sometimes heroes would be forced to rush from long distances to even further points, in order to rescue people, and thus had to have stamina to match the challenge. They also needed to be able to cooperate with other heroes to reach their target, working together to ease the burden on a single hero. Numbers were power after all. To further increase the challenge the teams the classes would be mixed, and the teams of three would be selected from many of the courses. After the 13 teams were formed, three teams would be put against each other to race. Luckily for Izuku, his team ended up being entirely of members of his class, Yuraka Chako and Jiro Kiyoka. The growling at the back of his head never ceased. He formed a circle with the two girls, hoping to get a plan going. Since he was his opponents were Team Manama, Nido Manama, Sasuna Takage and Kirishima Jiro, and Team Kendo, Itsuka Kendo, Pony Tsunatori and Tania Ida. The plan to win would need to be formed rapidly, to ensure their chances of victory. Izuku immediately increased the blood flow to his brain, his eyes already turning into the fear-inducing state he was known for all around now. The girls looked at him and waited for an answer. He offered them a question. Do you have any new developments for your quirks, new support items or skills you picked up on your internships? Kyuka raised her hands to him, facing them backwards and showing him two microphone-like attachments to her wrists, while her jacks also pointed to her boots. Will these do? She asked with some sass in her voice. Izuku smirked, glancing at Yuraka. The girl displayed a fighting stance, something much better than what he remembered seeing back in the school festival. The tales, please, as quick and short as possible. The three teams readied themselves, with the goal, being locating Aizawa Sensei, the VIP, and reaching him to complete the rescue race. The vampire had already developed a semi-decent plan, to conduct his search and rescue mission effectively, but he felt something almost coming out of him. The growling reached his own throat, Izuku stifling it forcefully to prevent embarrassing himself randomly. He remembered something now. Wasn't Manama's quirk related to copying other people's quirks momentarily, with direct skin touch being a requirement? The vampire let his head shot towards where he could see the blonde teen, feeling his inner beast straddling the bars of the cage inside his mind. A faker has emerged among us. It challenges the order of nature with a mere imitation. Creighton. How dare he try to copy the glory of a true ancestor. Izuku's wild side kept the roars going inside his head, the vampire clenching his jaw shut to avoid releasing a growl and maintain some calmness. Now that the inner beast had been awakened from the food-induced stupor from before, Izuku's already sharp senses now increased even further, he could smell someone almost like him. Not totally equal, as there would be nothing like true ancestor in this world, but he could sense the smell of someone with a quirk, that he could share a sense of kinship. After he had such individuals submit to his might, as there needed to be order established around here, else things might devolve into senseless violence. The quick whiff of the air pointed Izuku's scary eyes into the direction of a group. His pupils ignored everyone that had no connection to the other teen's smell, hyper-focusing into one particular individual of Class 1B. A physically imposing teen covered in brown fur who wore sunglasses and had a collar round his neck, two fangs poking from lower jaw. Izuku had yet to make acquaintances with the other guy, but a gut feeling from the vampire almost had him showing his own pair of fangs to the teen. Izuku wasn't one to fall into his baser instincts and display testosterone-filled habits like an animal, but it took considerable willpower for him to move his gaze away from the fur-covered young man and focus on his current task. Yuraka and Jiro had, inevitably, noticed his mood and sent him worried-filled glances. He brushed their care aside, stating that they should better focus on the rescue. When Airhorn loudly blared to indicate the start of the exercise, sending the teams into frenzy. Well, almost all teams. Izuku and his group stayed at their exact location, the vampire crossing his arms and waiting for something. Yuraka touched him in his clothes, relieving both of gravity's hold on them, and making the vampire float into the air. Not without precautions of course. As a shadow tendril exited from his boots and latched around one of Ichako's hands, the girl effectively holding Izuku in the air, almost as if he was a balloon. It would be a somewhat comical sight, were it not for the strange way that the shoulders area of the Hemomancer's clothing began to shift, almost as if something was trying to sprout away from it. While Izuku was in the air, Kyoka busied herself with her own search. She placed both her new support items on the asphalt, connecting her jacks into them and focusing. It was hard for her to clearly distinguish between so many sounds, but her sonar sound wave field technique was set up. Clearing through the white noise took time though, so she still had much to improve on. 
She began with a 1 km radius search, sending a constant stream of her heartbeats in high frequency to try and locate her teacher. The move took some time to set up, but once she locked on the VIP's location, they would be precisely on top of it, instead of having to rely on sweeping tactics. There was some interference, she had just barely began to get a hold on this move after all, but with her aid, her team would know the location of not only the VIP, but also their opponents. She cleared the first radius, and immediately began to work on building the frequency to expand another 2 kilometers. Some sweat began building over her forehead, the focus to use this type of technique being hard to pull off. Yuro was just about to release a second wave when she felt a tap on her shoulder. She opened her eyes, unaware of the moment she had closed them in the first place, and faced Yuraka, wondering why the girl had called her. Izuku is changing tactics. That was all the explanation the brunette offered the punk rocker, which made Kyuka click her tongue in annoyance. Not that Achako seemed to be bothered by it, pulling on the shadow tendril to bring the vampire down without cutting the effect of her quirk over him. Lo and behold, Izuku descended and the sight of him made the rocker girl white in her eyes in astonishment. There was no noticeable change to his physical appearance, outside of his creepy looking eyes, but his body could never make that much shadow cover them, unless he had stapled some wings into his back. Stapled would not be the correct term. He had created them with the use of his advanced hemomancy. Vermilion wings that seemed to pulse, their appearance akin to those of a bat. They looked leathery, but the rock-loving girl was sure, that leather did not look like this. The wings seemed to be sprouting from his shoulders, giving the vampire got the club that could hardly be matched by anything she had seen in her life so far. I spotted a few members of the opposing teams approaching our perimeter. Physical combat would not be a problem, but since our priority is rescue of the VIP, I think that we need to take to the skies. Izuku explained, already at work. The shadow tendril, that he had handed to Yuraka thickened, beginning to slowly creep its way to the gravity girl. More shadow matter pulled around the vampire's waist, dark tendrils nodding into a stronger construct. Kyoka had no time to react as the oddly cool to the touch tendrils made to grab her. She yelled in surprise as she was pulled into the vampire's frame, her body turned so that her back would meet his torso. She was about to complain to Izuku about the rough treatment when the shadows began to morph themselves around her body, avoiding touching anywhere inappropriate, but still making shivers run down her spine. She gazed down to find the shadow tendrils had wrapped around her almost like a climber's harness or web suit harness. Jiro would be impressed, as she wasn't embarrassed by the way they tightened around her body. A little warning before wouldn't kill, you know Jiro used her elbow to knock on the vampire's torso, regretting her decision immediately as pain flared due to her elbow meeting the ceramic plating that lined his coat. Izuku didn't bother to comment anything. Weren't they all wearing at least knife-resistant gear? I would, but then again, where is the fun in that? He replied, making sure that his shadow matter had safely secured the punk rocker. Sure, it had the slight side effect of looking like he had placed her into a strange bondage suit, but hey. Don't mind the details. The green-haired teen could feel a glare firmly settle into the back of his skull. He looked back to see Yuraka narrow her eyes at him, tightly holding the shadow matter that he had given to her. He rolled his eyes at the threat from the girl, the tendril of darkness that she was holding expanded and wrapped around her the same way as Jiro. It nestled the girl against the vampire's back in a way that did not get in the way of the crimson wings that sprouted from Izuku's shoulders. The group was slightly floating above the ground, the weight of the girls holding Izuku down. Not that it soon mattered, as the wings darkened almost as if dyed in black. The blood that made the temporary add-ons hardened, his shadow control mixing with the liquid life force, and reinforcing the construct to become even stronger. The wings now resembled the wings of a planar jet, the strange mix of sci-fi and horror, as a low humming noise echoed from the far edges of the newly built blood construct. Get ready to take off. Kyuka, keep searching for Aizawa Sensei, and don't let other noises distract you. Yuraka, please maintain alertness and watch our surroundings. This is a fairly big build, it takes quite some concentration. Izuku gave some commands, pulling on a number of quirk factors to make flight possible. The bad wings quirk he received from the Nomu was a fine addition to his repertoire, but it wasn't exactly usable as it was. He couldn't sprout leathery wings, and at most the quirk factor granted him some knowledge on flight and proper gliding. Essentially, in his hands it was a rather obsolete quirk, or so it would be, if only had that quirk factor. Advanced hemomancy to create a rough frame, blood hardening shield to give the construct a truly solid shape, shadow control to reinforce and encase the liquid, further defining a proper frame capable of flight. Stable blood creation to give it a final and true form, and let him not have to worry about losing blood in case his focus was broken, and finally, flammable and cooling blood to serve as thrust fuel and cooling agent. Izuku had managed to create jet wings for himself. The preparations took a ton of time and incredible amounts of focus. It wasn't even truly finished, as proper flight was only viable now, due to gravity's lack of hold over his body, due to Uraka's quirk. The technique currently was a patchwork of ideas and quirk factors that was a mess, but the vampire was content that he had even managed to get this much working. I have several questions. 
Jiro shouted, her hands firmly holding into the black matter that posed as a web suit for her. She ain't the only one. Yuraka's shout also reached the vampire's ears, but it seemed that he had decided to ignore their complaints. The command over his blood and the dull noise that was being emitted from the edge of his wings grew to become a roaring sound, heat warping the air around the wings, but most importantly, it propelled Izuku and his group high into the air. The sight of the group rising into the air was impressive, the students that were observing the exercise from a room finding their jaws hitting the floor. This is so unfair. Is it even possible? What can this guy do? Bra fucking leech. Having aerial advantage as well as the means to track by sound, it made the group almost instantly the candidates for the round's winner. As Izuku took flight, a floating head was staring at him with bulging white eyes. That is such bullshit. Sasuna Takage exclaimed, sure that her body was displaying all her emotions without the need of her head. How on earth did a core could grant someone that much power? The girl could not wrap her head around the idea. As soon as her group was allowed to move, she split up into various bits to cover a wider range and facilitate a group search. Monoma was left behind with the radiant dude from 1A, Takage, almost sure that the blonde vice president was about to go into one of his usual rants about their sister class. The green-haired girl noticed that Monoma was quieter than usual, his hands trembling a bit before the exercise began. She chalked it up to nervousness. She was pretty nervous herself. It would be the first time that the two heroics classes did a joint class, but the second class already had a taste of the abilities of the first class during the school festival. The bitter taste of defeat at the hands of their sister class, served to spurn 1B to train hard, the flames of rivalry fanned even further by Vlad King Sensei and Monoma. It was petty to get carried away by those feelings, but a majority of the teens couldn't help themselves. It hadn't been a long time since the beginning of the year, yet Wana had been constantly under the spotlight, receiving praise and attention that normally should have been divided equally for all the first years. Sasuna didn't really care all that much for the rivalry, but even she felt somewhat miffed at the clearly preferential treatment that had been going on. Well, maybe she might have forgotten that you are an unmeritocracy, and that if people were receiving attention, it generally was because they deserved it. She swore in her heart to stop listening to the bullcrap that Monoma kept feeding them. Takage tugged at her power, feeling her floating head return to her body. Head reattached to her neck, the girl finding Monoma to be constantly holding the hand of the radiant fellow. She furrowed her brows. Since when was Nido Monoma capable of acting civil outside of his plans or tricks? Even the guy from Wana found it weird, his eyes looking back at her and silently asking for help. She could only stare back with a confused expression. Monoma noticed her presence and rushed to her side, immediately triggering the effects of the Radid's quirk and hardening his arms. So, did you manage to find the VIP or the other teams? His voice trembled a bit, much to Takage's growing suspicion that something was wrong. She pushed past the strange feeling that began to sprout in her chest, nodding to him. I didn't spot Aizawa Sensei Klasabi, so we'll have to do another sweep later. What I saw though, is no joke. She exclaimed, a bitter smile present. Sasuna explained to her group what she had seen, tension strangely building up among them, as the unknown feeling she had sensed earlier grew. Monoma's hands shook even more, the blonde turning his head to Kirishima, and narrowing his gaze with sharp eyes. The hardening teen shook his head quickly in denial of any knowledge of the matter. He had already shared what little info he had on Midoriya, and even if talking behind his back like this felt somewhat unmanly, Ijiro also wanted to win. How was he supposed to know that Izuku could grow jet wings? Monoma grunted in frustration, his fist smashing against the wall of the alley they were in, the bricks cracking in a web-like pattern around his hand. It was at this that Sasuna called it. Okay, cut it out. What is happening to you, Monoma? You're acting all weird and stuff ever since the beginning of the match. What's wrong? It was at this moment that Kirishima noticed something about his current male teammate. He was sweating a lot, his lips constantly smacking almost as if he was extremely thirsty or dehydrated. What truly called the Redeed's attention now were the sharp-looking claws that were on Monoma's hands, the canine teeth in his mouth looking sharper than ever. It reminded Kirishima of the first training exercise he had to do against Izuku. Dude, did you copy Izuku's quirk? Monoma lifted his head to match his gaze with the Redeed's, a slight tint of crimson light shone from the teen's pupils. Itsuka Kendo was considered the big sis of 1B from the get-go. She had been the one to talk with all her classmates on the very first day, breaking the ice and allowing the group of unknown teens to begin talking with each other. Their temperament and common sense were generally the best in class, as were her combat skills and CQC. It was what had allowed her to reign in her more aggressive classmates during their training and sparring matches. Coupled with her little tolerance towards any type of bullying or no looking down on other behavior, no other choice was eligible for class president. It was what earned her the nickname of Big Sis, or Nego, as Asuna sometimes liked to tease her with. She was the go-to girl when it came to matters concerning 1B. Spending time with her classmates as she had, Kendo seemed to almost instinctively know when one of her friends had gotten into trouble. That sort of troublesome feeling now was ringing full force in her heart, making the girl a bit distracted. Her partners for this exercise. 
Nidatania and Sunatori Pony were doing their part, only Kendo seemed to be out of the loop. The speedster was doing periodic search sweeps, Pony also doing her best to help in the search, Kendo trying to aid in the search, but failing it due to her feelings. There was something. A weird bubbling that settled in her stomach and made her unsettled. Atsuka-chan. Is you fine? The broken Japanese brought the martial artist out of her musings, the orange-haired girl turning to face the American blonde. Luckily for them, Ida was currently doing his round of sweep searches, and would not be here to overly correct the girl, and he had already done a few times so. Yes, Pony. I'm just a bit out of it. Kendo answered, her eyes wandering around trying to catch something that would tip her off as to why she was feeling such strange dread. Having their aerial advantage over their opponents as well as having Jiro acting as a listening device, Izuku's group managed to quickly locate Aizawa Sensei. The pro was simply lazing about atop a water tower, waiting for the group that would locate him. Izuku stopped feeding the thrusters of his wings, slowly beginning to descend from their current altitude. For the first time in quite a while, Izuku had been feeling true body fatigue hit him. He wasn't sure if it was the use of a multitude of quirk factors like this, or maybe it was the amount of blood that was currently outside of his body, as well as the amount used for thrust fuel. In any way, he preferred to err on the side of caution this time, and settle on the ground before acting. Their descent wasn't smooth, Izuku still working hard on suppressing the growls and snarls that threatened to leave his mouth, due to his inner beast. His wild side kept whispering about dominance and violence, wishing to already establish himself at the top of the food chain here. The vampire was having none of it, keeping the whispers locked into the cage of rational thought. As their feet touched concrete, the dark matter that held that girls receded back into the hemomancer, letting the two females free from its grasp. Yuraka released the effect of her quirk on him, making the vampire feel the full weight of his jet wings. He commanded the solid jet wings to liquefy, the creation slowly began to be absorbed back into his body. Izuku then had to immediately make use of his reaction time, and catch the two jacks that rushed towards his throat this time. He caught them with one hand, looking at the rock punker with a questioning gaze. Don't look at me like I'm the unreasonable one here. From where do you keep pulling these weird ass ideas? Jet wings. What else, you gonna tell me that you can the part of a dragon in breath fire? The Kuma Phoenix Kyoka complained in a loud tone, a petulant tone died in her voice. Now, he could simply finish the exercise and all, avoiding answering their questions and busy himself with a mug of coffee. He could also do that and take note of the ideas Jiro had just given him. He was about to try a joke, to see if he could clean up the mood and end this training session already, but the inner beast scratched at the bars of his mental cage, this time the wild side of the vampire not playing any games. That faker has finally put our power to use. It is best we hunt him down now and show him his place, before he can become a nuisance for the others. I'd hate to see him damage one of our sparing partners or a potential mate. The teen couldn't help but agree with his instincts. The growl now did leave his throat, enough that even a racer had should have heard. Complete the training, I think something is happening. He gave the quickest excuse he could make up at the top of his head, already turning to direct himself towards where he could sense the pale imitation of true ancestor, that Nido had done. In all honesty, Izuku wasn't fully in this sudden search out of the goodness of his heart. Ever since Manama had copied his quirk, the vampire had been feeling stronger animosity than ever at the blonde male teen from class 1b. Kendo would have to forgive him, but Izuku would have to be a bit rough around the kid, else this problem would never truly solve itself. Iraka and Kyuka found his sudden shift in tone strange, but before further questions could be asked, Izuku vanished from their sight, no doubt a use of that blink technique that he could employ. The girls decided to secure the area and scored their team the point, leaving Izuku to continue his chase. The male team moved like the wind, rushing to the east part of the training grounds to find Manama. His quirk was sensing the parlor trick imitation, giving the vampire a direction to follow as Izuku skipped around the rooftops. The hemomancer's senses begat to zero in on the sudden scent of blood, a life liquid he was unaware of. The scent of the person was familiar, yet he hadn't tasted this person's blood. He stopped on one of the many rooftops, building power on his legs for a full power jump. The floor cracked under his feet as Izuku leaped to great distance, his coat flapping on the wind. The roar called his attention, the vampire finally having triangulated a location to pinpoint. He let his body freefall until he was close to the alley he heard the roar, expanding his shadow matter to grab on walls and slow his momentum, until he stopped a few feet in the air. Hanging on due to the shadow tendrils that dug into the walls. He was lowered to the ground, dodging a piece of large pipe connection that had been launched at him. Izuku's eyes scanned his surroundings, finding Kirishima protecting his partner, who had fallen on her behind, and seemed to be in shock. He could understand why. Manama looked overly feral. His hands sported gruesome claws, the visible veins on his hands and face bulging as they pumped blood with great pressure. His dull blue pupils had become slit-shaped, red veins spreading all over the orb, and giving the teen a fearsome look. Added onto that was also the leaking killing intent that the blonde had around him. 
Izuku was pretty underwhelmed by the killing intent, having already felt stains and dead shots. Monomaz felt like a mild breeze caressing his skin. Kirishima also had already felt true killing intent from villains, thus he was just fine with this. The girl cowering behind him, however, seemed to have never felt something like this. Izuku could not judge her on that, deciding to keep his eyes on the pseudo-vampire in front of him. It felt out of place to call Nido even a pseudo-vampire, as the imitation was lesser than that. Still, being imitated like this still angered Izuku. Settle down, Manama-san. If I have your core correct, the effect will be gone soon. Sit still for now. Izuku tried reasoning with the other teen, his eyes also capturing the sight of Kirishima's ripped costume. It seemed that the Redita protected the green-haired girl, his tough body and heart and core perfect for the job. Ah, the Wonder Boy of 1A. I was hoping to meet you soon. Manama's voice was warped, his eyes staring holes into Izuku's frame. The blonde slouched his frame, his entire body trembling almost as if suffering the symptoms of a terrible withdrawal. This terrible thirst won't stop, you know. I will quench it with your blood. The blonde rushed the green-haired teen, slashing with his claws to rip the Hemomancer to shreds. The vampire dodged the clumsy slashes easily, signaling to Kirishima and Satsuna, whom the vampire just recognized no, to flee and let the teachers aware of the situation. The redeed shouted at Roger and took Takage away from the scene, Izuku somersaulting over a double slash from Mido, and blocking his way out of the alley. If the vampire was right about the copy of True Ancestor, it would not be a pretty sight if the blonde was exposed to the sun. Izuku bit the inside of his cheek, wondering how he would deal with the blonde. He had a few options available to him, and he wished to not overly brutalize the teen. Animosity against him and his blatant copy of True Ancestor, Izuku didn't have a reason to pick a fight against Manama. And then, Itsuka won't be here to protect you, Wonder Boy. She even disregarded my opinion to follow the words of an inferior chump like you. I will destroy you. Manama shouted, coming with knife hands to probably spear and run the vampire through. Ho? Oh, I see. Right? Heart and blood coated the edge of Izuku's blade, making the Tanto blade of Night Edge resemble a baseball bat. Ninpu Hisatsu, Shutsujin Kira, Shinobi Art's ultimate move, Apparition Killer. The words left Izuku's mouth, his right hand moving his weapon in an ascending arc. Manama never saw the truck that hit him. He could feel a dull throbbing sensation right under his jaw. The young blonde teen thought that he was hallucinating. Only hallucination could be the answer to his vision being upside down, the rooftops and industrials buildings strangely getting farther from the teen. The sun shone its light upon Nito, the boy cringing away from the light and using his hands to shield his eyes from the sun's rays. The strange sensation from under his chin also became present on his hands, the core copying teen opening his eyes to find the sight of his limbs reddening and growing boils, akin to if the boy had dumped boiling water over him. He would scream in pain, but his jaw could not follow through, considering the blow he had received from Izuku had cracked his jaw. Even under the now excruciating pain of his skin burning under the light of the sun, his senses picked on the vampire that had suddenly appeared alongside him. They both were free-falling, Manama still wondering how high he had been launched by the attack. His dull blue orbs captured every detail of Izuku's face, the Hemomancer's eyes sporting their crimson color inside a black abyss. Manama's world was engulfed by an abyss of crimson light, the pain of his burned skin forgotten under the influence of Izuku's powerful words. The last things the blonde boy could remember were the crimson slit staring him down and the oddly cool embrace of something that wrapped around him and stopped the pain. That could have gone better. Izuku murmured to himself, bringing with him Manama wrapped almost like a burrito. Shadow control covered the teen and shielded him from the effects of the sun, Izuku confirming his theory that Manama had copied True Ancestor with both its advantages and its demerits. Enhanced power and feral senses were good and all, but toasting under the sunlight wasn't something exactly pleasant, as Izuku was sure that the blonde found out. He calmed the snarling roars inside his mind, grinding his teeth inside his mouth to entertain himself. The vampire brought his hurriedly wrapped burrito along with him, as he rushed back to his teacher, making sure to keep the copy teen outside of the reach of his former deadly enemy. It didn't take the green-haired teen much longer to reach his teacher, his team together with the man. Who looked less than pleased with the vampire. I have an explanation. He mused an answer to the sleep-deprived man, the pro taking a deep breath before he sighed. Go on then, Midoriya. Explain it. Izuku wasn't expecting the pro hero to allow him this respite. Manama copied my quirk. It is not something that is easily controllable, or that someone could master in a short while. Izuku kept his answer short and understandable. It seemed his answer achieved the effect he wanted, the pro closing his eyes and pulling his phone. How's the kid? Aizawa grunted a question, opening his eyes to glance at the mass of dark matter behind Izuku. Izuku shrugged his shoulders. I'm sure that he is fine. I have put him to sleep, and my quirk grants a healing factor, so he should be okay. The teacher wondered why the green-haired vampire was so nonchalant about the situation, but considering he had brought his rampaging classmate down, Eraser had decided to go with the flow for now. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoyed. 
if you want the next part of this video. Like subscribe, and comment down below, and turn on that bell notification, and also check out the other videos that I have created, and enjoy. See you in the next video. Peace.